Uh, hopefully I don't butcher some of these uh, names too poorly. But we started verse 6, cha chapter 20 in Ephesus, and he made his way all the way around to where we'd call the area Greece, down here in Corinth. And his plan was to get on what they call a pilgrim ship, essentially at that time, to make his way across the Mediterranean Sea east here to Jerusalem in time for Passover. Uh, but when he was in the Corinth area, he was made aware of a group of people that wanted to do him harm. So he was being led by the Spirit not to get on that pilgrim ship. So he ended up backtracking. You can see how the arrows take him to Corinth and then the arrows take him back through Macedonia once again. So instead of making it to Jerusalem for Passover, he ends up spending Passover in Philippi. They're at the top northern part there of Macedonia. Um, so then he took another ship across to Troas. He did a little bit of walking after spending all night teaching. We said about 22 hours maybe in teaching time where Eutychus fell out, the, fell out of the window from the third story higher than the roof you see here. This is a two-story roof elevation, so imagine another story on top of that and him falling out the window to the ground, pronounced dead by Luke, author of Book of Acts. So the boy was dead. Paul comes running down and lays down on him, and he comes back to life. So there's one of the seven resurrections that we talked about last week as well, of Paul bringing Eutychus back to life. After that 22-hour teaching, an all-nighter, he walks 20 miles from Churoaz to Asos. Uh, that's one way of pronouncing it, better than the other way of pronouncing it. <laughs> um, so then he gets on the ship there and then makes his way, kind of bounces down the shoreline here uh, to Mytilene, to Chios, to Samos, to Trogilium, to Miletos, and that's where we're going to pick up now uh, here in um, Acts chapter 20, verse 17. He's still trying to get back to Jerusalem, obviously not now for Passover, but now 50 days essentially after that, he's trying to make it back for Pentecost. Um, and last week I showed you a little um, chart that I made trying to track the, the timing of where we picked up, I think it was in probably verse 6 or 7, where they start getting on the ship and making their way back and it spent one day here, one day there, and seven days there and so forth. He pretty much ate up about 25 days of that 50 days time that he was needing to get back to Jerusalem for Pentecost. So by the time he gets to where he's at now, he's still got around 20 days. And I say around 20 because now that he's in Miletus, he actually bypassed Ephesus. He didn't want to stop in Ephesus uh, because he didn't want to go on shore and be surrounded and just really occupied by a lot of the people there that probably would want to see him and talk to him again. So we went all the way down to Miletus and sent for the elders up there in Ephesus. And then the elders have to come down to where Paul is at. So there is some time that has elapsed there out of his remaining 25 days or so to make it back to Jerusalem for Pentecost. So let's begin in Acts 20, verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. So this passage that we're about to embark on, verse 17 down for a, a, a few more passages, um, well, essentially the rest of the, the, the chapter is a great leadership passage. I say that because this section of Scripture is the only speech in the whole book of Acts um, that's really addressed specifically to a Christian audience, um, which are all leaders, uh, which happens to be all the other, all, I don't, I hate to word, use the word all, but I think most, if not all, the other speeches that we read about in the book of Acts are more towards Jewish and Gentile audiences or speeches that are kind of a legal discourse. We haven't gotten into too many of those yet, but coming up in the next coming chapters, Paul is going to actually be providing a defense for himself in several different places, uh, and those are recorded here in the book of Acts as well. But so now Paul has called and sent for the elders um, from Ephesus, and they come down and meet Paul. So this speech is to the elders of Ephesus, also mentioned are the words overseers or shepherds also, and pastors in this passage from 17 down to 38. They all refer to the same group essentially. They're kind of a, a synonym for the same person. So we got a shepherd, we got an overseer, we got a pastor, we got an elder. They're all kind of referring to the, the same person, type of person here. So, so verse 18, and when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you. 
So for the next several passages, there's actually kind of some key words in each of the scriptures where I'm going to pull out kind of what I call a, a mark of Paul's ministry. So this first mark of Paul's ministry here in verse 18 is his open life. We need to live an open life like Paul did. He said, you know, in what manner I lived among you? So it was pretty obvious from his wording of that that he was probably pretty open in sharing with his lifestyle, with the people that he hung out with. Um, we talked about last week, you know, he didn't go anywhere alone. He liked hanging out with his fellow disciples. He walked and he traveled on the boat, not alone, but with many other men that went along with him. So he had an open life and he shared openly with everybody that he engaged with. And he had a very good relationship with everyone, apparently, that he, at least in his close-knit group, because you saw in verse 1 of Acts chapter 20, we read about last week, that he embraced the disciples that were with him. And then in verse 38 or 37, at the end of this chapter, we're going to read how all these elders that we're talking about now are hanging on Paul's neck and embracing and kissing him. You know, in a, just like the, the French type kiss peck on the cheek, I hope. <laughs> it's that type of embracing, just endearment, <laughs> in a manly way, of course. It's just kind of an endearment that they had towards Paul because uh, we're going to read as we get towards verses 35 through 38 that they're thinking this is the last time they're going to see Paul. And Paul had spent over three years with them, so they've got a, a pretty deep relationship with them, and they just know that the way things are going, that Paul may not make it back um, hit their way once again. So they're, they're very sad to see him go. But he had an open life. He continues on and says, Serving the Lord with all humility. Again, this is still Paul speaking. I was serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Uh, the, the plotting of the Jews was the same type of verse that we read last week when he was down in the Greece area, when he did not get on that ship, that pilgrim boat, to go across to Jerusalem. is because of the plotting of the Jews that were uh, attempting probably to to kill him if he did get on the ship there and go across to Jerusalem. That's why he didn't. He backtracked through Macedonia and is ending up where he is now. Um, so here is another mark of Paul's ministry is his humility. You might think that it's not very humble for him to say that he is humble. Well, it would be considered boastful unless it were true. You can read many different passages uh, throughout uh, this book and the other books that Paul has written and we can see uh, that Paul is a very humble person. Uh, there's a, a story that I heard someone quote, or it was on a podcast maybe that I was listening to, that just kind of reminded me of uh, somebody or something not being very humble. And it's actually a story about a woodpecker. <laughs> so imagine this woodpecker. Uh, he was flying around this neighborhood on a, a, a dark and stormy night. Uh, imagine this was last week when Hurricane Matthew was coming through. Uh, wasn't it Saturday when we got all the rain? Uh, anyhow, this woodpecker is looking for a place for shelter, uh, away from the storm and maybe a place for, uh, to stay dry. So he finds this nice tree and he lands on this branch and it's uh, raining really hard and he said, well, what the heck, I'm here. I might as well start pecking on this tree. So he starts pecking on this tree like woodpeckers do and he's only at it for a couple minutes, uh, so not very long. And then all of a sudden there's this crack of lightning that hits the tree and a big a uh, loud sound of thunder and the, the woodpecker goes flying away from the tree and he's kind of fluttering out there by the tree looking back at the tree and all of a sudden the tree just kind of goes and falls over and the woodpecker's looking at the tree and saying, wow, look at what I did. And he had nothing to do with the tree falling over though, right? But he was kind of taking credit for that tree falling over. All he had done is a few little pecks on the tree. So that woodpecker wasn't being very humble, right? He was uh, taking credit where credit wasn't due. Uh, and Paul was not that type of person. He was a very humble person. Um, so he was uh, not willing to take credit for hardly anything. So this brings us to our first life, less life lesson. The people that God uses are the people most amazed that God uses them. The people that God uses are the people most amazed that God uses them. Who else in Scripture might we think of that was a pretty humble person? What about Gideon? Uh, Gideon was humble. God called him a mighty man of God. 
And he looked around, Gideon looked around and said, Who? Me? You're calling me a mighty man of God? I'm hiding here in a wine press, stomping out the wheat, hiding from the people around me. And I'm the least of my family. And my family is the least of my tribe. And my tribe is the least of all the tribes. So you're calling me a mighty man of God? I, I don't figure this. I don't understand. But, you know, we don't always understand things that God claims. Who else was humble? How about Moses? He was very humble as well. He, he said, God, you can't use me. I have a speech impediment. That's why he got his brother Aaron to help him out. He was arguing back and forth with God, and Moses, or God said, well, okay, I'll give you your brother Aaron to be your mouth type thing. How about another humble person? How about Saul, the first king of Israel? Uh, he started off very humble in his ministry as king of the area, but prideful, very prideful at the end. It's when these people, and we even see Gideon, if you look back in the, that book, a story of Gideon as well, his um, ministry did not end well either. He ended up uh, being very successful in battle, and they ended up uh, accumulating a whole bunch of gold, and they made him a huge crown, and he just became very prideful at the end of his ministry as well. Um, it's when people, it's when people like Gideon, Moses, Saul, lose the amazement that they lose the edge that they once had. We are all nothing more than just simple instruments, really, when we think about it, that God is using. We're just simple instruments that God uses. Imagine a patient kind of waking up after a surgery and the doctor standing over him, and the patient says to the doctor, where's that scalpel that you used? I just got to see that scalpel. I need to look at it and examine it and just figure out what's so cool about this scalpel that it was able to save me. That's why I had to go through the surgery and it was able to heal me from that cancer that was inside my body. I got to see that scalpel. And the doctor says, well, I'm sorry, I had to throw it away. And the, the patient looks at the doctor and says, you're kidding me, I got to get that scalpel. Where do you throw it away at? Go find it for me. And so, I mean, you can kind of see how ludicrous that is that the patient wasn't recognizing the instrument that God uses wasn't the scalpel. It was the scalpel in the hand of a person that God gave the skill and talent to to use the scalpel. So we are kind of the instrument that God is using, just like the doctor used the scalpel to cut out the cancer from the person's body. Another quick life lesson. Pain from others and God reshaping our lives through that pain is what adds value to our lives. Pain from others and God reshaping our lives through that pain is what adds value to our lives. Talking about reshaping our lives and the, the pain that can be involved in our lives, imagine another scenario of you got a, just a $5 pound bar of steel. So a one pound bar of steel, maybe it costs just $5. You take that one pound bar of steel and you reshape it into two horseshoes, now you can maybe sell those two horseshoes for 10 bucks. So a little bit of reshaping, heating it up, reforming it, now that $5 pound of steel is $10. Cool, you doubled your money. What if you take that same $5 pound of steel and make it into a whole bunch of scalpel little blades that are then put onto the tool that would make it into a scalpel? So that's a really fine, I mean, you have to take that pound of steel and cut it into little itty bitty chunks and sharpen it up and all that. So now maybe that those scalpels are worth, actually, it, could be close to $35,000 for those blades. Those instruments are very expensive. So $5 into $35,000. Now if you take that same pound of steel and refine it and shape it even more and get it down into a whole bunch of, imagine how many little springs, you know the little pens that we have, you push on the button and it has that little spring in there to push out the little ballpoint pen thing, uh, or maybe a fine watch where you've got springs in there and gears and cogs that are made out of little fine little pieces of metal. And those springs and those cogs, they have to be shaped and twisted and torqued on to get them to the way they want. You can make thousands of little springs probably out of a pound of steel. So now if you do that, now that could be roughly $250,000 for all those different springs and stuff for those fine watches maybe. So the same $5 pound of steel could be reshaped to be formed into many different things at a much higher value. 
So the pain, the fire, the beating, the reshaping of the steel is what adds worth to it. So the pain, the fire, the beating, the reshaping that we go through in life is what adds value to our life. It doesn't seem like it in the heat of the moment, though, does it? We never want to be the one that's suffering a, a loss of a family member or a physical ailment or something that's just causing us to really seek the Lord. But this is something that can happen, and it can add value to our life. Verse 20. Paul still continues to keep speaking here, and he's saying, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. So another mark of Paul's ministry is unselfish service. If there was something he could do or say for your benefit, he would do or say it. A good definition of a minister, you could probably guess, is what? Maybe a servant. So a good definition of a minister is a servant. Paul was definitely a servant. It's been said that there are two types of people in the world. One that walks into a room and says, Aha, here I am. And then there's another person that walks into the room and says, Aha, there you are. That second person is the servant. He's looking around for other people to engage with other people. He's not trying to draw attention to himself, but he's looking for other people that he can reshape maybe and just kind of speak something into their life. Uh, that second person is the servant. Which are you? Do you demand to be noticed? I've heard it said we are never more like Jesus than when we serve other people. We are never more like the devil than we want others to serve us. I can't remember where that quote came from, so I don't have anybody to attribute that to, but it's pretty powerful. We are never more like Jesus when we serve others but we are never more like the devil when we desire or demand others to serve us. I thought that was pretty powerful. Continuing, he says, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Another mark of Paul's ministry we see from this passage is it was balanced. So Paul's life was balanced. Paul taught to the Jews and to the Greeks. Paul taught repentance and faith. Repentance is something we've heard many times. You know, Pastor Nick, Pastor Kevin, Pastor David, they've all kind of, uh, at some point in time in one of their teachings, they've kind of uh, shared a, a definition of repentance. And it's basically just turning from our sins towards God turning from our sins towards God, making a 180-degree turn. I think even um, Steve mentioned a, a definition of repentance uh, two or three weeks ago when he was going through one of his studies in uh, Acts 18 or 19. But repentance is dynamic. Uh, it requires change. There is no gospel without repentance. There is no gospel going forth without change. You kind of have to change ourselves sometimes to speak those words out. Uh, there's... I don't know, 15 people in the room right now. Uh, if I were to ask by a show of hands how many people really think they have the gift of evangelism, I know Pastor Nick would raise his hand, but I don't know how many other people would probably raise their hand and have that freedom in their spirit to just go to any door, to any person, and just kind of openly share the gospel. We should feel that way, but it's hard to do it sometimes. Um, so there it, it needs to happen to share the gospel, and we've all probably done that at some point in time where we felt the, the, the angst uh, of opening our mouth and sharing the gospel. But it's weird. Once you, you know, Pastor David has even said, you know, sometimes when he had to talk himself into it, he would go, one, two, three. Can, have you heard about Jesus? Do you, can I, and he would just start into something, but as soon as you start opening your mouth and words start coming out, it just gets easier and easier and easier at that point. You just kind of have to get over that hurdle where you can just kind of start that conversation and then it just goes much easier. But there is no gospel without repentance. And it says that Paul taught repentance and faith. Faith is demonstrated. Repentance and faith are two sides, I think, to the kind of the same coin or of the same issue. If we go back to verse 20, 
Paul, in verse 20, um, it says, Paul proclaimed sometimes and taught or instructed in other times. Also there in verse 20, it says that Paul taught publicly and house to house. And then we're going to read in verse 27, uh, coming up in a little bit, that he will teach the whole counsel of God. Uh, parts he likes and parts he doesn't like. Parts he understands and parts he doesn't understand. That's the whole counsel of God. And when I came to this point in, in the uh, passages, uh, it made me think of a, an SOD verse, uh, which the guys in the back of the room uh, have already um, covered in one of their classes. So it's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's, that's the whole counsel of God. All scripture. Verse 22. And see now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Chains and tribulations await me. Another mark of Paul's ministry is his sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. His sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Some say that Paul may have been out of the will of God by, test, by steadfastly wanting to go to Jerusalem after many different warnings of bonds and chains and tribulations that he was going to suffer if he were to go to Jerusalem. Um, but he did it anyway. Uh, and how do we know that he was kind of on the right path, that he was sensitive to the Holy Spirit and he was being led of the Lord to do all this? You know, many people told him not to go there, not to do it. Uh, but he still did it. Uh, and I guess the ultimate testimony that what he did was right, he won't, we won't read about until later, but it's in Acts 23. So not too much further down this history line, uh, Paul's going to hear the words of Jesus to him saying, But the following night the Lord stood by him, the Lord stood by Paul, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So that to me right there is just Jesus confirming to Paul that what you have been doing, what you're going to continue to do, where you're going forth to do to, in Jerusalem and eventually to Rome, you're doing what I called you to do. You've got it right. Keep listening to the Lord. Keep listening to the Spirit. Uh, you've got it going on. You've got it going right. So that's pretty cool um, that Paul was able to um, kind of get that that word, we call it, from Jesus himself. Verse 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy, and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Wow. Going to prison where there are bonds or chains or tribulation doesn't move him. He's not really affected or scared of anything that all these different people have been mentioning to him. He's willing and wanting to go forth regardless of the outcome. And we already know from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 20 up until this point, several different instances of Paul being beaten and left for dead. And then he just goes right back into the same city where they beat him and just continues to preach and teach. Um, so again, he's like the Energizer Bunny, he just keeps on a ticking, he knows what his mission is, and he just keeps on trucking. He, uh, it's amazing. Uh, God has had just got a, an amazing control on this man's life, uh, and he just, it, it doesn't move him. Uh, it's just amazing to think, you know, what, how much does it take to, to move us, to, to shake us, to rattle us? Sometimes it doesn't take, us, take that much to get us discombobulated. Uh, to get out of sorts is another word of saying, another way of saying it, I guess. But Paul knew what was awaiting him, and he's going to get reminded, I think, in the next chapter by a prophet of what else is going to be coming his way, and he's still going to keep on trucking and making his way to Jerusalem. So another mark of Paul's ministry is a wholehearted commitment to God. A wholehearted commitment to God. And if you want to read about more 
of the commitment that Paul has. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 27. And these verses are speaking of Paul. Paul saying, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep, in uh, journeys often, in perils and waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fasting often, in cold and nakedness. Wow. Those are some incredible things that Paul endured and went through. See if you, how many movie buffs we may have here. When I run, I feel his pleasure. When I run, I feel his pleasure. Anybody know? Chariots of fire. So that line came from chariots of fire. It's a story of Eric Little in the Olympics of 1924. He, I mean, I haven't watched the movie in a decade. I, uh, I've been trying to, I tried to get it on Netflix, but they didn't, they aren't, they aren't streaming it. And I didn't have time to um, reorder it to get it by DVD. And I forgot to ask anybody here if they had it. But I was going to hopefully rewatch it. Uh, but I just remembered that line from that movie. When I run, I feel his pleasure. And I, I imagine that's kind of what Paul was like when he walked, you know, from Troas to, to As Asos. <laughs> maybe 20 miles by land, 30 miles by sea. We would mentioned last week that wherever he went, whatever he did, whenever I walk, I feel his pleasure. Remember when he was making that 20-mile walk we talked about last week? He was alone. At that point in time, he didn't want anybody with him. That was after ta talking for 22 hours, and then he walked 20 miles. He wanted that alone time. We talked about last week how he needed that alone time. Uh, like Jesus also spent many times alone seeking solitude for prayer and just to, to have some alone time with the Lord. And that's, I can imagine Paul kind of saying that same type of phrase that Eric Little did, uh, when I walk, I feel his pleasure. When I preach, I feel his pleasure. Uh, when I help others, I feel his pleasure, is maybe what Paul would have thought and said. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching, the kingdom of God will see my face no more. So this is where Paul has let the elders from Ephesus know now that it's likely that Paul will not see them ever again. So this is why they're going to be very sad at the end of this chapter, is because Paul's letting them know that um, he may not see them again. When I was listening to Pastor Chuck um, teach through the book of Acts, I was um, trying to listen to it to, after I'd kind of done my study to see what type of things he brought out of it. Um, Pastor Chuck mentions secular history says that Paul did see the elders in Ephesus once again, but that's not confirmed in Scripture. After Paul's first trial acquittal by Nero, secular history says that Paul may have gone back to Ephesus, and others say he may have gone to Spain with the gospel or maybe both. Um, so again, there's no claim in Scripture that says that Paul did make it back to Ephesus, but there's secular history that accounts that he may have done it as well as gone to Spain, or maybe both. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Paul wasn't afraid of saying he was innocent when he knew he was. We see him doing this also recently in a study from a couple weeks ago in Acts 18, verse 6. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon you, on your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Uh, Steve was talking about this passage uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, and, and it's that picture of Paul taking his cloak or his tunic or his, whatever he was wearing and he's just kind of 
took it and kind of shook the whole hem of it and maybe dust kind of billowed off of it and stuff. And he's just kind of saying, I'm done with you guys. I'm going to go teach to the Gentiles now. If they, they're the ones that maybe want me, that they'll listen to me. And he was speaking to the Jews here. They just were not willing to, to listen uh, when he was trying to uh, teach, teach them. But Paul was of the same accord. He was not willing to um, speak up when he knew he was clean or when he knew he was speaking the truth and speaking things rightly that he heard from the Lord. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God is received by teaching all of the Bible. Not teaching from the Bible, but teaching the Bible. So many church pastors would probably be offended if you asked them if they were teaching the Bible. They would say, of course I do. What do you, what do you think? I'm a, I'm a pastor at a church. Of course I teach the Bible. In essence, they are not really teaching the Bible, but teaching from the Bible. Every passage, every scripture they come to is kind of like just another departure point for them to jump on their own bandwagon, their own topical type teaching uh, that they so easily want to do. And here at the bridge, you know, that's not something we do. We teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and that's why when you leave here on a Sunday morning or on a Thursday night and you come back the next Thursday or the next Sunday, you pretty much know exactly where it's going to be picked up on and the teaching is going to continue. They're teaching the Bible, not from the Bible, and that's a, a great thing. That's a great place for safety to know that... Um, men's opinions are not going to be forced uh, into the teaching. Um, there's going to be application derived from the teaching, but it's going to be the teaching that's put forth first and then application upon that teaching that we learn about. Verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Notice what I have here highlighted in red, the New King James Version in the word shepherd. Now if we go over to the King James Version, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. It's interesting here how the, the term changes shepherd the church versus feed the church. Uh, there's several passages, many passages in Scripture where it talks about, again, I'm, I'm piggybacking on the whole counsel of God topic that we read about in the previous verse, but feed the church, is, he's talking about feeding the Word of God to the people of the church. Um, so that's why um, Pastor Chuck brought up, you know, this verse uh, in the King James Version where it says feed the church, he preferred it versus, you know, the New King James Version where it says shepherd the church. Both are appropriate, but maybe more so the word feed the church because, again, he was, Pastor Chuck was just so focused on nothing but the word, nothing but the word, nothing but the word in his teachings. He was feeding his congregation just like we're feeding our congregation here, the word of God, uh, and that was so important. And Paul was reemphasizing the importance of feeding the church the word of God. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul is saying there will be trouble from without when he leaves. So he's letting these elders from Ephesus know that when he leaves, chances are there's going to be discord, there's going to be division, there's going to be wolves that come in and want to stir up things in your church. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. So trouble will also arise from within the fellowship when Paul leaves. Not just from without, from without or outside the fellowship, but also inside the fellowship when he leaves, there's going to be trouble. People will try and draw attention to themselves and cause division. That's so real. I mean... 2,000 years ago to today, this still happens, doesn't it? You read about in the newspaper or you hear about it from a friend or from a co-worker and you may look at them and say, how was church on yesterday? Maybe it's Monday. And they said, well, 
can't go to church anymore. My church is split or divided or there's just, I don't go there anymore because there's so much stuff going on. Um, it's unfortunate we, we do hear that on occasion uh, because there's division from men inside the church and from outside the church that can cause division and just destroy churches. Some churches split. Some churches just completely stop from attend or meeting anymore because of discord that's going on inside of their own fellowship. Uh, and it's a very sad thing to see. Uh, I think it was just last Sunday when PD was uh, talking um, and he was mentioning, you know, some things that God hates. Um, he did go to that passage of scripture, so just maybe for a uh, see how many people were actually there, or if, if you were there, how many remember that passage of Scripture? Where was it from? Proverbs. Yep, so Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, it mentions seven things that the Lord hates. So this is pretty important. Whenever you see the word hate, or we're going to see in this passage the word abomination, well, those are heavy words and things to really pay attention to when you are reading through your word. Uh, whenever your devotional time is. Verse 16 says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that defies wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness, and one who sows discord. So I highlighted that one in red. And one who sows discord is the person causing division, uh, the possible person from inside the fellowship that's got the little whispering and the bickering and talking behind people's backs type things that could be going on, uh, one person against another, just telling stories, little falsehoods, all that stuff can lead into division, um, and it's not something to engage in. That's the gossip that we got to stay away from. Uh, if you are listening to the gossip, you're participating in the gossip. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is an overseer. This is a responsibility of an overseer to watch. For three years, nonstop, Paul warned people. And notice what it says, with tears. So was he just tears of joy? Or was it tears of anguish? I'm thinking it's a little bit of both, but maybe more of the latter, because sometimes when you have to engage with people, maybe there was a little bit of division going on already. Uh, we know from the other letters that Paul wrote, he had to really do some correction uh, when he was writing these letters. Um, and so often he was not shy about telling people when they were doing things wrong. For three years, he did this ceaselessly, without ceasing, he would do this. So you can imagine how many kneecap to kneecap conversations he had with men that probably weren't easy conversations to do. Uh, they were, I mean, in any church you go to, there's always going to be things that aren't going the way the Lord would prefer them to go. So sometimes, I mean, I've had conversations with people in this fellowship that weren't the best, I wasn't looking forward to them, put it, put it that way. So as a, as a person in leadership, sometimes elders and staff members and pastors are asked to sometimes confront or address certain issues that are coming up because maybe there is that, that wolf in sheep's clothing or things that have been said that need to be corrected. So you can see when you get into those type of face conversations that they don't always hap end up happily. Uh, they usually end up happy. Uh, it seems it's, it's, it's just kind of a, it's not in my notes or anything, but it seems like every conversation that I ever had that I wasn't ready and willing to go into that I knew had to be done, it seemed like every one of them was received well. It was like the person recognized that what they had said or what they had done wasn't right, and they owned up to it, and they were just like, wow, I, I, I didn't realize anybody even noticed for one, and then they just didn't really, they were surprised that someone cared enough to sit down and talk to them about it, and that made them feel good, and then they repented of whatever it would have been, or whatever it was, I mean. Um, so 
but during that conversation, there may be tears because you're trying to get to the root of the issue. Um, and sometimes those conversations are tough conversations to have. And that's where the tears, I can imagine, uh, had come up for Paul. And I had personal recollection of, of this type of stuff happening as well. So that's kind of what it meant to me. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul knows he is not going to see these elders ever again. Paul is saying the word will strengthen us, secure us, and sanctify us. That's, that's pretty cool. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or their apparel. Paul was saying he was not a hireling. He wasn't in it for the money. Wherever he went, he wasn't collecting money for himself. We started off talking last week about the reason he went back through Macedonia was to collect money, but for what? To return it to the poor of Jerusalem was his whole purpose. And he even wanted the, the elders or the men that were collecting the money from these individual churches that he was going to he wanted the men to follow, to come back with him to Jerusalem so that they could give the money to the poor of Jerusalem. So Paul, and probably also accountability. Paul didn't want the, uh, you know, okay, I picked up 250 denarii here and 1,000 denarii here and 100,000 denarii here and try to make it all the way back to Jerusalem over the course of two or three or four months, whatever it was going to take. And, oh, I, I lost some of the money along the way. <clears throat> Uh, but he had all these people that are witnesses that, this is speculation, that's why he wanted them to come back to, to Jerusalem with him. So he had witnesses and then he had the uh, accountability there, essentially, of all of this going on. But Paul was not a hireling. He wasn't in it for the money. And we actually know that Paul was far from being selfish. This is a, a, a clip I got from uh, somebody that I follow on Twitter. Um, he's part of the Dave Ramsey uh, team. Um, or he's speaking at some of their conferences. But anyhow, he, he quoted it, one thing they did recently. You can only get so far being selfish. You can only get so far being selfish. And, you know, I just mentioned a little bit about how Paul was not selfish. When you're selfish, who does that benefit? Who does that gain? Really, only yourself. You're doing things to, to, to benefit yourself. But what is the, the antonym or the opposite of being selfish? How about being generous? When you start being generous, not selfish, now you've got that multiplication factor going on where when you give to somebody else or bless somebody else, you're blessed actually, whether you believe it or not. You probably feel good when you help somebody out and when you give them something, so you get blessed. But then obviously the, the, the receiver, they are blessed as well. And then just imagine that person they usually tell somebody about how they got blessed that day. So they may or may not share your name, that's not important, but the, the idea is that they received a blessing and they kind of share it with somebody else and they say, wow, you have an awesome friend or somebody that blessed you. So when you're generous, it usually blesses and serves many other people. So it's much better to be generous than being selfish because you can only get so far being selfish. Verse 34, yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. So again, Paul wasn't selfish and he wasn't collecting anybody's money for his benefit. He did not live off of anybody's money. Paul was a tent maker. Uh, we see this mentioned a couple times in scripture and he used that talent to make money enough to pay for his necessities. So I, uh, I can't imagine making tents back in his day, what they had to be like, with some sort of needle and thread, um, uh, without a sewing machine and the heavy burlap or the heavy, I don't know if they made it out of leather or burlap or goat's hair, goat's hair but it had to be something that had to be stitched together. So uh, you can imagine how strong his fingers and his hands would have to be and calloused probably and just kind of rough working with goat's hair. Um, I know the tarps over the tabernacle, they had goat's hair and wolverine hair and hides from different animals, and they probably could use all of these things to make tents with. Um, but that was his occupation. Wherever he traveled from place to place, he earned his keep. 
He earned his own money. He didn't rely on the, um, the, the offerings of the people there around him. So Paul was saying he didn't want anything from the people there. But you'll notice all the false teachers do want something from the people. Oftentimes, false teachers, uh, and again, you hear about them on occasion in the news and so forth, uh, that they're really saying, you know, they pass the plate seven or eight times during a service. Uh, you know, Pastor David mentioned, you know, how we don't do that here. Uh, other churches are not like here. They pass the plate one a dozen, a mul not a dozen, multiple times, uh, and they just kind of, it's really kind of a, a ploy, just like Pastor David said, the more you pass the plate, you probably would get more offerings each and every time because people feel guilty, and the Word tells us you don't want to be giving when you're feeling a sense of guilt. It should be coming from a cheerful heart. Um, so Paul is recognizing that false teachers are abounding and he's letting them know that the wolves are going to be coming in from without and you might see them also from within. Verse 35. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. These words of Jesus are the only place they are recorded in Scripture. They're not going to be, you won't find them anywhere in the Gospels. Uh, at least that's what it said in my, um, my notes of my study Bible. But they're not in the Scripture, and they're just there by Paul somehow being made aware of them, that he records them here in the book of Acts. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting, too. Uh, you know, as you go through the Synoptic Gospels, that there's many parallel passages of the same story being retold through the Holy Spirit in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, penning those words, but the stories are just slightly different in every recorded instance. But here, Paul somehow heard about Jesus saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And he recorded that for us. Because he said that Jesus said this. Even though Paul never met Jesus in the flesh, it's still interesting that he heard it from somebody but the, that somebody didn't record it in either of the Gospels. Paul was saying it is important that the elders do help support the weak because most often others won't. Watch out for that person that is overemphasizing what you should be giving to God because the New Testament emphasizes what God has already given to you. So we need to be careful and listen and pay attention to who we listen to on our podcast or on the radio or on TV and be looking for those people that are overemphasizing what we should be giving to God. Uh, it's not all about that, for sure. Verse 36. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. I wonder if he and the Ephesian elders were kneeling in the sand by now on the beach. I can just kind of picture this whole time that Paul called the elders from Ephesus to come down, because uh, we're, we're going to read in the next verse or so that they're near the boat, that the, Paul is about ready to board and go on. And we aren't told anywhere in Scripture that they're inside at this point in time when Paul is talking to these elders. So I can imagine them on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea there before Paul's getting ready to get on the boat and go and Paul's saying these words that he's not going to see them ever again most likely at least that's what he thinks about at this point and now the elders are, have been leaning on all of his words up into this point he's been there teaching for over three years so they have incredible respect for Paul and now he's saying his goodbyes as the waves crash up on the shore so, let's finish up with verse 37 now. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. So these elders were so thankful, and they loved Paul. Uh, remember back in verse 1, Paul embraced the disciples. Now these elders were embracing him also. The elders were going to miss Paul's wisdom, mostly his words that he spoke to them for three years. So that's how Acts chapter 20 ends. They accompanied him to the ship 
And next week when we get into Acts 21, we're going to see how Paul gets on a ship and starts making his way back to um, Syria and then making his way from there, um, Tyre, I believe is where they land in Syria, and making their way from uh, Tyre down into Jerusalem. But the church of Ephesus has kind of got a, a legacy. Um, it's written about much later in Scripture by John, the apostle, in the book of Revelation. There in the book of Revelation, there's um, letters written to seven different churches. And one of those seven different churches is the book of Ephesus. And the title in, in my book, my study Bible, um, calls this letter to the Ephesian church, the loveless church. And it's pretty incredible after everything that they had been taught and shown and shared with by Paul that they were a true church of love at one point in time. But then by the time John writes his letter, he's told to write this letter now about the Ephesian church. And it's in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So even if the Ephesian church did not love as it should have, at least the Lord could positively say, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were a, a heretical group that troubled the churches at Ephesus and Pergamos. Um, so we are left with Paul boarding his ship to head to Syria and landing in Tyre. There, he immediately is told again not to go to Jerusalem. He's told again not to go to Jerusalem. Pretty amazing. So he's ending his third missionary journey. He's made his way from Antioch all the way to Corinth. Didn't get on the ship to come back to Jerusalem. His plans were thwarted there. So now he's still trying to make his way back to Jerusalem. He's going to land here in Tyre in the next chapter and make his way down to Jerusalem. So that's where I'm going to leave it for our next elder to teach us next week. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this evening and this opportunity once again to be in your word and to study your word. And Lord, just thank you for the, the hearts of these men. Lord, I pray that we all continue to study your word and read it and help us, Lord, to be diligent to do that. And help us, Lord, to, to read each and every word carefully, to know and to try and understand what the word, the story is that's going on behind these words and kind of put our place in, that, in these situations whenever possible to know the what Paul must have been feeling like when he, when he was walking the 20 miles after staying up all night, uh, just having that alone time, and what it must have felt like for Paul talking to the elders from Ephesus there on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea, saying his goodbyes and what that must have been like, knowing that when he left, there was going to be division coming into their church. And as we read about in the book of Revelation, that this Ephesian church, based so much on love, somehow during the course of time loses some of that love and they don't act and love others the way they should. So it help us, Lord, to, to always have that, that faith, hope, and love that we read about in 1 Corinthians. And Lord, help us always to have that hope and to share that hope with others. Yes, Lord, the, the hope and the desire and the knowledge of your second coming. 
So, Lord, just continue to be with us and guide us and teach us. And, Lord, help us to, to love others. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.